Welcome to Midnight Menu Plus One. I'm Ray Kanata. And I'm Margot Moss. Midnight Menu Plus One is part of the family of shows on the podcast network, It's NewOrleans.com. We've got another great show lined up for you tonight. And if you're hungry for more Midnight Menu Plus One that we can dish out over the next 45 minutes, we have all kinds of extra stuff like recipes and guest gossip, sneak peeks into who's coming up next week, and much more on our website, It's NewOrleans.com. And while you're there, you can check out our blog, or you can sign up for our newsletter, you can follow us on all kinds of social media. That's itsneworleans.com, or just Google Midnight Menu Plus One, or find us on our Facebook page. Our show today is brought to us by Petite Pet Care. If you're going out of town, working late, or have a school or work schedule that keeps you away from your home and away from taking care of your pet, Petite Pet Care can help you out. The folks at Petite Pet Care understand that some pets are fine going to a kennel or doggy daycare, but others prefer the comfort of their own home. Petite Pet Care will take care of your cats, dogs, fish, birds, and chickens. Yes. They're insured, bonded, Red Cross Pet CPR, and first aid certified. But most importantly, they love animals. For loving care when you're not there, Petite Pet Care. You can find them at their website, PetitePetCare.com, or by calling 504-300-9PET. You know, Margo, we should also thank Monkey Hill Bar on Magazine Street. Check out their happy hour, weekdays from 3 to 8 p.m., 350 well drinks, a dollar off beer, wine, and signature cocktails, and tell them Ray and Margo sent you. Now, each week on Midnight Menu Plus One, Margo and I invite a member of New Orleans' restaurant and food community to join us, and we invite them to bring along their own mystery guest, a Plus One. We never know who the Plus One's going to be. Sometimes it's a, a friend, a neighbor, family member, fellow restaurant colleague. Well, our special guest tonight at Midnight Men- Menu Plus One is uh, culinary writer and recipe developer Addie Martin of Cole Curious Food Blog. Uh, before she gets here... Margot, I had a I had a pretty good food week. Uh, I went to um, I wanted to mention I went to La Boca for a friend's uh, bachelor uh, dinner. I was officiating at his at his wedding, and before that, we went to La Boca, and I uh, just ate and ate and ate. Had some great steak. I spent like one hundred and twenty dollars. It was worth every penny. Most of that was wine, but it was awesome. Great. Oh, I was just terrific. Love that place so much. I haven't been there in a few years. And then I went to a new place. Have you been to uh, Sandwich? You know place? No. I've on heard Maple? about it, but I have not been. How was it? Great. Uh, based on the one sandwich I had, I loved it. I, I got the Cuban, which was maybe the least expensive thing, I think, on the sandwich menu. And it was fantastic. So I'm assuming the best. The rest are even better or as good. It was terrific. And um, I'm going back there for sure. And then uh, I went to Crawfish Boil on Easter. And it's like my eighth crawfish boil this season. But I'm not getting sick. I haven't had a crawfish yet because I just like the vegetables, actually. You know, but the vegetables have gotten more and more abundant in the nine years that I've been doing, that I've been going to these things. It's, it seems to me. I don't know. If we, did you grow up with, like, artichokes and all this other stuff in your crawfish no. boils? Artichokes this is kind of new, is, right? Well, it's new to me. I love it. I think they're making them more and more sophisticated. You know, pineapple now, Brussels sprouts, you know, whole onions, all this stuff that's in there all the time. Big carrots, giant carrots in there, which I love. And, but I was there, and it was a great mix of people. It was a bunch of rolling elvi and doctors and just mixed people, uh, musicians. And then Tori McPhail of uh, Commanders was there, and Woody from Woody's Fish Taco we had on the show was there. And it was such a great mix of people, but uh, food was absolutely fantastic. Wonderful. I uh, went to a new restaurant the day they opened. What was that? Milkfish. Oh, how was it? I had the appetizer sampler, and it was great. It was, um, I didn't really realize what I was eating, and I, I thought I would be upset, but it, it tasted so good. What was going to upset you about well, it? Well, I couldn't figure out what one thing was, and it was a, a pig t- fried pigtail. Pigtail, okay. Yeah. I thought you were say like a, no, something else I mean, works. It just, okay. No, it, w- it just was a little Tail's surprising okay. when I figured out what it was. I don't know but if I had a point. Was it curly? No, it was kind of nubby. Does it straighten out when you when you fry it? <laughs> I don't know. Because aren't they all curly? Well, well, we'll talk about it and another cartoons, time too. Because uh, I think our guests are here. Awesome. So, welcome, Addie. Welcome. Hi. Hi. How are you? 
Glad you were here. Yeah, me too. Thank you. Wow. And you've brought uh, something beautiful. I brought snacks. It's actually deviled pimento cheese in a little phyllo cup. Wow. I was just going to bring the deviled pimento cheese, but then I was like, wait, let me kick that up a little bit and put it in a phyllo cup. Excellent. You know, everything's fancier in a phyllo cup, so. <laughs> <laughs> now, is this uh, something that you have come up with to, uh, is that a... You, re yeah. you developed this recipe? Yes. I, well, I have the recipe for the deviled pimento cheese on my blog, but not in the cup. I just thought of that this week, so um, I may end up putting it up there. This is a dumb question. What, what, what constitutes deviled for um, pimento cheese? What makes it deviled? Usually deviled means spicy, but these aren't really spicy. What I have is a pic um, pickles added to it, and instead of pimento, I use pepidus. So it's got a little bit more flavor. And there's some smoked paprika in there, which gives it a really nice kick. Now, is this uh, pepidu? Mm -hmm. Is that That's a type of pepper, Yes, correct? yes. I believe and is it brine, little brine peppers? You usually see them in, uh, like on the olive bar at a... Um, any grocery stores, there'll be the little peppers that oh. are hollowed out. They're bright red. Addie, I'm always mm. the first one to eat. Oh, she beat me to it. Margo <laughs> beat me. What? I was going to say because I, I can't focus on the interview as long as there's food in front of me until I start eating it because uh, food's more important to me than people sometimes. I, mm. I, and, uh, I understand. <laughs> I totally understand. No. Yeah. That's really good. I've been listening to the podcast. I was like, well, I can't show up empty handed. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Let the record show we like all guests better when they bring food. <laughs> I really important. Or, or wine. I figured, ah, oh, that's, yeah, what I'm missing. <laughs> so I can't get a question in because I'm chewing. That is, has a nice spice. Mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. pep it's not overwhelming. Let me propose yeah. something, Margo. Why don't you talk and I'll just eat. Mm -mm. <laughs> no, you don't like that suggestion. Okay. Now, I'd like to know a little bit about... Uh, where you're from, sure, and uh, how it informed where you are today. Okay, cool. Um, I am originally from a small town called Golden Meadow. It's in Lafouche Parish. It's pretty much directly south of here, just a tiny bit southwest. So, yes, there is still some land down there. Um, mm -hmm. It's actually on the way to Grand Isle. So if anyone's ever traveled to Grand Isle by car, you have driven through my hometown because there's only one way. Um, so my family is from, you know, Golden Meadow in that area. My parents actually met. They lived on the same street. Um, so we, um, you know, I lived there my whole life, essentially. I went to a college in Thibodeau and went to the culinary school there. But, you know, we always grew up eating very, very well. My mom was an avid home cook. My dad um, also was very handy around, you know, the outside kitchen, which is, you know, barbecuing, boiling grilling you know all that type of stuff so uh, we just grew up eating really good food and you know honestly when I was younger I didn't really think about cooking too much um, it wasn't really until I was in college when I started exploring that side of it and um, when I happened to go to Nichols State University where the mm -hmm. Chef John Falls Culinary Institute is and I um, just kind of stumbled into there and was like oh this is pretty cool and just you know, really enjoyed culinary school a lot, um, learning about cooking and food. Um, that was really fun for me, and just the learning all the, the science and the theory and just the methods behind everything. Guess, you know, the why behind everything. So the culinary school is part of, of Nickel State? Yes, okay. yes. So you get, so you're like basically, uh, you're majoring in um, mm -hmm. I, ha I have a ba uh, Bachelor of Science in Culinary Arts. They offer a bachelor's and an associate's. So I, I chose to get the bachelor's. I was already a junior in college before I decided to switch over. So, <laughs> but yeah. So and it's a, and a part of the accredited university. So it was pretty cool that I was still able to use my scholarships and stuff to get that degree. Yeah, there's not a lot of uh, places where you can get a BA in culinary arts. Right. right yeah. yeah. It, uh, I don't think it's the only one, but I can't think of. I know there's some other, and I think it's a private school. I think they may be the only public university it's amazing only only Louisiana and John yeah. Fols um, um, is does he he supports the program or yes. does and he actually when, teach or when I was any? there he was teaching uh, one of the classes um, I'm not sure if he still does it because I know they have they now have Marcel Bienvenu on staff over there so I don't know if he used to teach the history of Creole and Cajun cuisine I don't know if she's taken that over for him because I know she teaches a class akin to that so but when I was there, that was 
I graduated in 2002, so it's been quite a, you know, quite a few years. But when I was there, I, he actually taught the class that I was in, so he had a class there every semester. Um, was he inspiring to you, and did you relate to what he was doing? Or yeah, I, th- I think so. You know, he, he's an interesting guy. If anybody's ever met him, you know, he's um, he's he's friendly, but he's kind of he can be a little. Uh, He's not afraid to tell you what he thinks, you know, and, and which I guess you can appreciate. I actually worked for him, too. Uh, I worked at the Lafitte's Landing at Bittersweet Plantation for like a year whenever I had first started going into culinary school. So I'd kind of known him before I had him as a teacher. But, um, yeah, you know, he was always very nice to me, and I learned a lot from him. You know, it's, he's like a walking encyclopedia. So it's really it was interesting to be able to just learn from somebody like that and have access, you know, and he really – I remember just being impressed with what I was learning in his class. You know, and he actually really challenged us not only in the kitchen but academically as well. We had like a huge term paper we had to do, and you know, so that was pretty interesting. Learned a lot about culinary research in that class too. So many people were in the program. Was it were there? Oh here? my, uh, I don't know exactly, but there, it was quite quite a. F- you know, they they were very limited on what they took, like because they only allowed I think like twenty students in each cooking class. So there may have been a lot more people in the program, but they you know they offered, you know, so there might have been like forty students, you know, because they did a, a morning and an evening version of like the the cooking classes, especially the basic ones. So you know, there's maybe forty new students going through it each time, but you know there was probably over 200 total at any one point in the program I would imagine I'm sure now it's gotten even larger because I've seen I went actually interviewed uh Marcel Biamino for the the book that I'm working on and uh I went to the the school's website and saw they had much more staff than they had when I was there so Uh it makes me think that the program's grown even more you mentioned the book tell us a little bit about the book you're working on is you're hoping to have this out in the fall oh yes it will be out in the fall it's we have to turn in the manuscript in July so this is a it's a pretty done deal on a good finite schedule can which you I can tell appreciate. us what it's sure, uh, sure. about and it's um, about southeastern food culture oh southeastern Louisiana food culture I'm sorry not just southeastern food culture <laughs> <laughs> but so we're looking at um, the area so basically like Vermilion Bay east to the Gulf south of the river slash I-10 essentially so we're just kind of basically the eastern side of Cajun country we're not including the city of New Orleans because you know the food culture here is completely different than the rest of you know the state so um, kind of looking at the more rural pastoral ways and we're looking at it especially through the fisheries so with a focus on you know oysters shrimp crawfish crabs and fin fish and how that all feeds into the food culture so about halfway through the writing process our final manuscripts due at the beginning of July so you know got a, a good bit of time Okay. Well, speaking of the Cajun culture, mm-hmm. and I wanted to get back to your sure. uh, blog a little bit. Sure. So you grew up in, it, that's Cajun. Your, yes. Your family's Cajun, yes. right? Yes. We're, uh, yeah, we're considered like the swamp Cajun, the coastal Cajuns, essentially, because down in, um, you know, right, Lafayette, those are more like prairie Cajuns, cause, uh. but we're like actually coastal Cajuns. You know, huh. and there unfortunately isn't very much swamp left where I'm from, but it, it's mostly you know salt marsh at this point. And you but have a pretty generic accent. Did you did you lose that? Did you have an accent at one point that was more pronounced? Or? I don't think I ever really had a real deep one. I, neither somehow neither of my parents really have a very strong accent. I'm sure to an outside ear it, it probably seems stronger, but and then I haven't really I haven't lived there since 1997, so I think it's just sort of worn off but I remember when I lit you know like in junior high this one guy he was like you have an accent and I was like what are you talking about he's like you don't sound like you're from here and I'm like, well do swamp uh, Cajuns have less of an accent or a different accent than prairie Cajuns oh probably I would imagine but they prairie some Cajuns people I can barely understand yeah and some people, some people have people very Lafayette, very thick accents it's more older people I think of the younger uh, people it I don't know TVs I think it's as much as you want to have it too uh, you know s- so, growing up um, there, um, did you? So, your web, your blog. I'm mm-hmm, sorry, I was mm-hmm. about to call it a no, website. Okay. Your blog, because okay. it's <laughs> not so computer That's all savvy. Right. Your blog. I noticed that um, there's an emphasis on local mm-hmm. and seasonal, mm-hmm. and um, is that tie into how you grew up? And I mean, is that important? To you personally, and how how did that 
infl- yeah. come about into your blog and absolutely um i think that's come about you know i think we we grew up living that way not even really realizing mm. it you know and especially with eating seasonally with the seafood and um you know my dad is an avid gardener so he always had all kinds of fresh seasonal vegetables i still get you know twice a year when he's like doing his big like you know about to transition to the next garden he just loads us up with vegetables and sends us home with that which is always really nice and I always get a little bit throughout the year too but the local and seasonal I think that's just more come about I, I, it's not something I've always like lived by as an adult but in the last couple of years it's something I've really come to embrace more you know I've gotten more involved with Holly Grove I contribute to their newsletter every week and just you know thinking more about food and now working on uh you know the blog and food writing full time it just you know really got thinking about eating responsibly and eating seasonally and how that just made sense and how that was just you know in the end it ended up being very important to me and the more I thought about and started doing it was like wow we can live like this and this is actually better for us better you know it's cheaper in the end I mean I find you know so it's just something that I've grown to embrace through just practice and adoption. So when you say responsibly, are, are you are you referring to uh, economically or health wise, or as a political statement, or what? What's um, the, uh, just like I don't just buy meat at the grocery store. Like we'll either like buy it from Whole Foods or get it organic or buy it like I like to buy as much as I can. Like at Holly Grove, whatever meats they stock. Sometimes I'll go to Cleaver and Company, like if I need a roast or something like that. So just utilizing butchers, trying to eat local meat when I can, and if it's not local meat, then um, you know making sure it's responsibly farmed or raised. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I'm asking is mm-hmm. like, what's what's what constitutes responsible for you? You're saying because it's the a, animal, a like animal welfare. You know, okay. making oh, so sure they were treated, treated well. Okay. So yeah, so not partly an ethical, political thing too. And huh? it's partially too. You know, you have to be careful of the meat you buy at the store. If it's just conventional meat that just comes from the grocery store, it you don't know what it what it's been fed. And I just you hear more and more. You know, I I forget. I'm sure it was on NPR, but um, listening to they were talking about how farmers were getting desperate for feed for their cows so they were feeding them like old stale and expired cereal and stuff like that because cows Mm. love sweet i mean who doesn't love sweet stuff the cows are the same way you know so they are just feeding them stuff like that and i was like that kind of really got me thinking like wow you know you are what your food eats so if i'm not careful Uh. about what my food eats you know so i mean it's the kind of rabbit hole that if you start going down there's there's really no end to it but you know just trying to do my part and i really try to do the local meats too one to just support them and to just it i find it they're just better overall smaller footprint you know so it's sort of i don't know i try i try to just live you know responsibly i guess it is maybe a little political a little environmental but i try to not make it about that and just make it about well your blog does not feel it does not feel to me it's it's wonderful because it's recipes and you're you're telling a story Mm -hmm. about you know your your life mm-hmm. and food and mm-hmm. but it's recipe focused mm-hmm. and it's really accessible good um and i wanted to n- know how you transitioned from what you were doing before because we, sure. we heard about college mm-hmm. but then were you working in the culinary world and uh, yes yes actually so I, I graduated like I said in 2002 and I had worked in a couple of restaurants then and then I was fortunate enough right after college to get an internship I actually lived in Columbus Ohio for a couple years right after what? college yes yes I was dating someone at the time um, who interestingly enough now he's the chef at restaurant August so oh wow I don't want to take credit for his success because he's <laughs> awesome but you know but did you bring him to New Orleans yes all yeah, right we came here together good, do- so. good job yeah yeah but you know. I was like, you should go work for John Bash. And he's like, yeah, it's probably a good idea. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so, um, yeah, so I was in Columbus, Ohio for a couple of years, was a banquet manager at a country club, um, then came to New Orleans. So I've been in New Orleans for 10 years now. Um, All right. And I kind of worked in restaurants at first, um, mostly in management, mostly front of the house, too. But then, like, of course, like after Katrina, restaurants were really tough to work in, and I was getting ready to finish grad school. So I was like, I'm ready for a change. So I actually made a huge change and went into working in advertising. And I worked at Peter Mayer Advertising uh, for almost six years. Wow. Um, but what was interesting about that, I worked in account service at first, but then I got into um, online advertising, which I really liked and thought was interesting. So I learned a lot about the internet and internet advertising, marketing, and just how websites work, just because not that that was part of my job, but just during these team meetings and you hear 
you just get exposed to the information. Um, and somewhere along the line, I had started my blog just as a you know way to stay connected to food and recipes. And I think you know thinking back on how did I get into local and stuff. I think when Holly Grove opened, you know I know they had farmers markets before, but you know when they had their the box when that came out, that was just kind of really new for here, and we were all excited about it. So. You know, my husband and I, who wasn't my husband at the time, we, like, mm -hmm. you know, when they started doing that, we started getting that every week. And when I look back on some of my older recipes, I was like, wow, I really was at first cooking really seasonally because we would get that food every week and I had to cook. And that's uh. mostly what we ate. And so that's when earlier this year I refined the focus back on the blog. No, actually, that was last year. I'm sorry. Um, to be the seasonal to be the local it's just to be doing something different because I for a little while I was just like a regular recipe blog and I was like what there's nothing really different about what I'm doing but I can focus on there's not a ton of blogs out there doing local seasonal food so that's mm -hmm. when I tried to like refine my focus back on that angle so for about the last year now I've really been focusing on that and then since the new year I've really been focusing on the food culture aspect too so not just a recipe but a recipe and a story about why the recipe or the food item is relevant to me or just relevant to a larger society if it's something that like you know, like I did um, a green papaya salad earlier this year and I didn't really have any experience with that before but I researched the recipe and what usually goes into them and kind of made up my own recipe you know based on that so I do like to explore other cultures too because it's a good way to learn about that kind of stuff. Huh. Now, can you make a living from this? Are you getting advertising, or what do you? Yeah, I get, um, you can. Um, I'm, I'm slowly working to that point, um, but I got, you know, it, it's a nice second income, let's put it that way, <laughs> <laughs> at this point. But, yeah, I mean, if I were a little bit more aggressive, the book has sort of slowed me down on um, endeavoring more into more commercial pursuits with the blog. The blog's actually taken a back burner at this point, just because the book is and now at the point where it's less than three months to being due. So, um yeah, mm. we, we do well with that, and, um, you know, um, it, it's a work in progress, I'll say. It's not the easiest thing to monetize, but uh, uh -huh. it, it's happening. All right. Well, your plus one is here. Why don't you introduce him uh, for us and tell us why you selected him and who yeah. he is to you and all okay. that. Okay. All right. Uh, I have brought today with me my husband, Jeremy Martin, and he's significant for a number of reasons, but uh, <laughs> the main reason it's relevant here is because he's my co-author on the book. We're actually writing the book together. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so what's the title? Have you told us the title of your book yet? Is that, oh, that's that's a, still that's, a work in progress. That's a ah. tricky question. Because <laughs> what I'm learning about book authorship is that uh, the, the title is not only your decision as the author, but it's also vetted through a number of people in the publishing side of the, of the yeah. uh, business. So we're, we're still working on the title. We're yes. working back and forth because we had a great idea for the title. And they're like, oh, no, we need this to be. You know, they have a lot of, we're working with the History Press, and they have a lot of specific requirements for their titles for their books. So, But we're looking at a title that will both alert the reader to the importance of the food traditions and the region that we're working in and uh, maybe be a little little capturing in well, itself too. You, as well. We can ask our uh, listeners to send you in suggestions <laughs> if it's still open. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> now let me ask y'all: do do you did you come up together with this idea, and do you pitch it to somebody, or did they reach out to you and say we want you to? They do actually something? reached out to me because of my blog, and they asked me to pitch them a book idea. Wow. Uh, yeah. That's which was got to be very. Yeah, affirming I, of what you're mm -hmm. doing and I hadn't really thought about it before I knew I had decided already I knew I didn't want to write a cookbook you know because even though I develop recipes I'm just like I don't feel my forte is necessarily in coming up with you know crazy cool creative recipe ideas you know I, I that's you know, it's part of what I do, but that's not the main thing. And for me, a cookbook, that's what a cookbook is. But I was like, you know, I'd be interested maybe in writing a, to you know, a written book and, and more, you know, topical focus. And um, so I was trying to come up with ideas and brainstorm. And then I, we finally came to something about Southeast Louisiana food culture. And I was like, you know, I was kind of nervous about tackling it on my own because Jeremy is also a re you know, writer. He's very talented. And I was like, oh. I'd feel much better if you were doing this with me. And so we were like, let's see if she'll take a dual authorship, you know? And sure. so Split I, the work up, you know? Yeah. yeah. I talked and 
Yeah. So what's your background? What did you? Uh, you oh, I have no writing background. It's right. always been a hobby of mine, and a, uh, I'm actually trained as a structural engineer. I have my master's degree in structural engineering. That's what I do all day. But when I get home at night, I write. Wow. And uh, so oh. at, really, if it was one of the, they always say, you know, what would you do if money wasn't a, a, an object? You know, yeah. it, it, I would write. Uh -huh. But the money's too good in structural engineering. <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you write at night? Do you write poetry? You're writing nonfiction? What do you, what are you doing? Yes, all of the above. Wha oh. Whatever he's, I feel. I he's good at everything. Huh. So uh, how has this caused any tension in your, in your marriage to collect? Uh, writing and, and writing together is a different mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, have you all had any... Uh, I don't. I don't no. mean to cause no, no, no. it no. on air. No, but no we we haven't. We no, actually, I'd like to see a reenactment <laughs> of a fight if you could, please. No, we actually are pretty good because we've discovered that we have complementary skill sets. Yeah, that's exactly oh. what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, there's some sections he'll write and I'll edit. There's other sections I'll write and he edits. And she's much better at the research side of things. And uh, if if. I'm a good writer if somebody can take the material and give it to me and say, distill this into something that's enjoyable to read. Mm -hmm. I hate researching. I've done it. Mm -hmm. It's mind numbing and it <laughs> just it it doesn't it doesn't activate the parts of my brain that I enjoy being activated. And Addie is is great. She's methodical, she's thorough. You know, she's very good at the research. And mm -hmm. so uh, that's what we mean when we say complementary skills. Mm -hmm. And I can devote 80% of my work week to the book right now. So it, that helps, too. It, it just made more sense. You know, it not only did it coincide with our strengths, but it just the way the time breaks up. So I do a lot of the research and distilling and I'll, I'll write some basic text and I'll be like, can you finesse this or take these, you know, five tiny paragraphs and turn this into a thousand words. So. Um, yeah, we're finding we work together well, which is, and we're excited about this book because eventually we'd like to do more culture writing, and and this will help give us both legitimacy as writers and and be a good, you know, springing board off of, um, you know, into that direction. I, I, when they approached me with the book at first, you know, it was a part of me that kind of didn't want to do it because I realized what a huge project it was. But you know, he really encouraged me to do it, and I'm really glad that we did. And with again with his help, it's been just. It's nice to know I'm not alone in it. You know, I mm -hmm. think it would be a lot scarier if it's like, this is all me. And I wouldn't want to do it alone. Mm. No. So uh, how did y'all meet? Are you from the same area? As I, I was Addie? born in New Orleans, but when I was uh, 10, I moved with my family to upstate New York mm. and lived there till I was 18. And then I went around searching for colleges and, and New Orleans coming home was one of my was was a big check in the column of Tulane and so I got a big old scholarship to Tulane and then that became another check in the column of Tulane and mm -hmm. so I went there I was one of the last graduates of the Tulane Civil Engineering program before they shut it off uh, shut it down after Katrina yeah so uh, but uh, I consider myself a New Orleanian even though I failed the high school test <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> but we, we actually met on uh, on Twitter yeah, that's how we first became acquainted. Yeah. Yeah. Just five. W years who was ago. following who? What do you mean? Uh, what? 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 Yeah, I don't how do people who, meet? On, I've yeah, never met anyone who met on Twitter. On Twitter. Yeah. Well, so we wow. weren't looking for each other no, on Twitter. No, no, no. And this we was just back in 2009 when there weren't as many people on. But um, it was kind of nice to get to know local. The local people that were on it were pretty cool. And I, I don't. I think I must have followed him because I would just at that time I was following anybody that was local that I saw on Twitter that seemed pretty interesting i just huh. follow oh, you know because just okay. to try to get to know more local people and you know if somebody you know i had a couple duds like i'd follow people and be like oh that person's not i was apparently whatever, very close to being a dud yeah <laughs> i would try to talk to him and he would never talk back to me and he didn't have a picture of himself up so i had no idea what he looked like but he seemed interesting so i was like oh i just kind of want to talk to this guy you know and i'd comment on something and he wouldn't talk back and i was like I'm about to unfollow him that's why is he not talking to me <laughs> you know and um one day I invited him down to Wednesdays at the square because we had just oh. all our friends. We would all go every week and just be. And so I saw he was having a hard day at work. So I was like, you should come meet me and my friends at the square, you know, because I was really curious at this point. I was like, what is up with this guy? You know, he seems interesting. But um, and then we met and just kind of started dating from there and got married like oh, not even two years later. So. Oh. Do you look like his Twitter picture? Do you have a Twitter picture? He didn't have. I do didn't now. Have, yeah, do now, now he does. But he was just had a. Um, picture of some the uh was that a rock karen 
No. A what? Yeah, it may have been a cairn or the What's flag. What's a cairn? A cairn is um, it's a stack of rocks you use to mark a trail. Oh, like that's like oh. a that's like a Scottish thing, isn't it? Well, no. it's it's used all over the world. Yeah, yeah but I mean the word is I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. probably it's not an English word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when you go on trails that are a little less marked, like people put up these little stacks of it's rocks. It's like a signal show. that yeah, there's like here, a, another trail. The trail it's goes. the path. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. right. sometimes you get on these Marks trails the and they're not very well defined and. I mean, I've never done any that are too difficult, but. So, were you really? Are you really outdoorsy, or was that just? I wish I was. <laughs> you know, we I strive p- to be. We we would love to be. I've I've often said that if I could change anything about New Orleans, it would be to plunk a mountain range down on the North Shore, <laughs> <laughs> because I love to be outside. I love the mountains. Mm-hmm. I I love the wilderness. But the problem is, the nearest wilderness is 14 hours away. You know, yeah. but we travel 14 hours, really, to real wilderness. Yeah, yeah we real? like to go to Big Bend. We like to go to Big Bend Not in Smokies. Southeast Texas, and the oh. Smokies are a little crowded. Oh, yeah. but uh, we love to do that. We do it, you know, whenever we get a chance, we go out and just hike up into the mountains for a couple days. We did hike 25 time. miles on our uh, honeymoon. <laughs> That honeymoon? does not sound like a honeymoon <laughs> to me. Actually, I'm projecting, but hiking 25 miles? We that, did it that over was three days. We did 12 over in one day. Tw- wow. It, oh, was, yeah. it was the most was a team building exercise. Bonding, team building, yeah. bonding exercise you can imagine. Well, did you all train for that? Yes. Or you just oh, yes. Oh, yeah. oh, yes. We trained My here in the city. My terrible places. I know. So, so I'm thinking about this, yeah. I don't, we, know, how to, I don't know how to phrase this. I'll, I'll just... We listen. were <laughs> weekly walking 10... 10 to 12 miles around the city so every like saturday for the two months leading up while you were planning your being married mm-hmm. you were yeah. focusing on yeah. walking you're, you're, and training, you're training for the honeymoon yeah so we were d- yeah. we only had the flat land around here so we would just training walk we do the distance so it's like okay and then at the end i think we did a couple walks with packs like just something on so we could get acclimated because we knew it was going to be you know a challenge Listen, it wasn't who enough. needs counseling like <laughs> pre-marriage don't you do don't yeah, people yeah. do that in i did church? three weddings this last week yeah. but but who needs that when you're like you're like training i mean if you yeah. can it was fun do something you were too tired like to fight after that well, and thankfully we but got you're married. too tired for other stuff i would think yeah. too that's yeah, like it was kind what of are you a, doing yeah Main, mainly walking and sleeping yeah. walking and sleeping that that yeah okay yeah, well, yeah. In on a the beautiful hike environment. Oh, it yeah. Was it was really it was nice. romantic it was to wonderful. me. Where, where are you getting at? Are you, you're I, you no energy I'm for us? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, no, not while you're hiking. That's just, it's, it's <laughs> like and you're all nasty anyway. You don't want to get it. Well, we have very once small. again. That sounds like the worst honey you've ever <laughs> no. heard of. No, to well, me, <laughs> to be honest. If you can get along together doing that, exactly. then growing old and being, you know, I think if you can have a good. Yeah, and it was romp great. in the and what if you don't? What if you don't? Well, I mean, then you know immediately. You. Well, that's yeah. true. You can get it annulled. Yeah, you because get that <laughs> out of the way real. That's quick. a good point. Within a week, yeah, we excellent done point. That hike. Most yeah, divorces are in year seven. You you could get it over in day exactly. seven. Exactly. Yeah, and and the great part was, uh, coming out of the Grand Canyon, mile twenty five, we're hiking right out, and it it was we woke up that morning in Indian Gardens and it was seventy degrees. We get to the top rim of the Grand Canyon and it starts snowing. And we're because soaked with April. sweat. It's early April. We're soaked with sweat. And the temperature has just plummeted below freezing. And we, we managed to, to the story drag gets worse and worse. The car. <laughs> it's getting better. It's getting better. And oh. we warm up in the car. And oh, there we, we go. And we get a cabin at the top rim. And we end up getting snowed in for two days at the Grand Canyon with nothing to do. All right. Now that's oh. a honeymoon. It was wonderful. It was, it was wonderful. And that, see... <laughs> It, it all balances out. <laughs> <laughs> the post hike burger was the best. The post hike burger, yes. Nice. <laughs> they had good food so. up there. Oh they, yeah, they national have, park uh, food. Yeah, you know? and oh. a, they have a few. Uh, there's at least three restaurants up on the uh, yeah. South Rim. Wow. Yeah, right. I mean, it, you're not picky after that. So the stri- <laughs> yeah, the strenuousness of the hike was immediately balanced by the following two days of nothing to do because. Mm. The road uh, that heads north from Flagstaff was snowed over. There was no getting out. And how long ago was this? Three years. Three years. We just had yeah. our second anniversary. Oh, congratulations. Oh, no, third. Third, okay. <laughs> Three years. We just had our second anniversary. Sorry. Okay, I see something peeking out of your pocket here. Oh, yeah. Uh, I just what, what, can you open that up and tell us what? Uh, oh, it's got a rubber band around it. Yeah, it's what? a great, there's a great notebook shop on Royal Street called Papier Plume. Oh, I know the place. Yeah, I yep. love that place. Yeah, I yeah. go in there and I spend more money. They walk in. I walk in and the, the little dollar signs pop up in their <laughs> eyes. And, 
And you have that because something may come to you yeah, in I always, general? Yeah, I always try and write down. And I used to keep notes on my phone, but I was too prone to deleting them when they were digital. And mm. once you put them on paper, one, once you kind of commit it to the, I'm not going to throw the whole notebook All right, why don't you away. read us what you wrote today? What do you, what do you I got? I didn't write anything today. Ah, it's all, it's all for effect. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, the last thing I was writing, uh, writing is uh, I was working on – our, our book is divided. The informational sections are divided by vignettes that describe the feeling and process of writing the book in Southeast Louisiana. Huh. And so I wrote a section uh, at a crawfish boil on Good Friday. Ah. And that was the last thing I had writ written in here. So, Were huh. you in South Louisiana at the crawfish boil? Yes, it's oh. at her sister's house. Mm -hmm. um, Just and this past Friday at my sister's. Her, her brother-in-law could boil a brick and it would be delicious. <laughs> <laughs> so he's pretty good. <laughs> he's, he's pretty good. So I, I was working on that, and that, that's what the last few pages are populated with here, yeah because so. we knew we wanted to write something about a crawfish boil and i was like oh good friday's coming up i was like you can probably just let's do that and yeah get yeah. some thoughts some fresh thoughts and ideas you know and, and we were pretty happy with how it turned out so has writing uh with a goal mm -hmm. um of w whether it's the book or your blog has that uh gotten y'all to have more experiences than you would normally have and and analyze it in a different way or yes i think that the second part is yeah. i think we now look we can get more out of what we do which is interesting because you can you you're looking at it in a different lens and and thinking more about it that's true i i think uh we're avid travelers and one of the big lessons of travel the hardest lesson to learn about travel is that to a certain extent you're always traveling even when you're home and writing this book has taught us to look at our home through the lens of travel and writing this book has sort of taught us that we need to look at the things around us like they are new and like we need to describe them to other people like we need to document them mm -hmm. and I, I think that's really the greatest thing the book has brought me or, or us so far is just this sort of being in the moment and present and being present and appreciating yes. appreciating it yes, yes. Uh, yeah getting an appreciation for just the familiar I'm learning so much more about my culture like where I'm from you know than I really ever realized you know mm. just in the research and reading other people's analysis on it and then just getting facts and tidbits and interviewing people and then formulating my own thoughts about it it's been quite interesting you know I hadn't I'm really appreciating it more and more because when you Get, have that feeling of like oh I just come from a small town and you know would, there's not there's like one grocery store in my hometown I don't even you know maybe two gas stations so it's it's it can seem small and you just it and kind of insignificant but the more perspective you get on that later in life it, it you really come or I've come to value that and yeah. really mm -hmm. see the the beauty in all of it I think that book that writing this book is teaching us that those small towns are very important and mm. they're very very valuable yeah mm -hmm. there's things preserved in those towns that can teach us all lessons mm -hmm. uh going forward and that's the part of the book we're working on right now is where does southeast louisiana go from here mm. mm -hmm. what what do we think the future holds for southeast louisiana and it's easy to be bleak because we have land loss and oil spills and hurricanes and political strife and all these things imported shrimp and imported <laughs> shrimp yeah, right and oh and the monoculture invading and, and local monoculture. culture being over i'm sure you got applebee's wanting to get into golden meadows well, or whatever. they're in homa right now they haven't oh, gotten further i'm than so homa. sorry to hear it so. no we're now going to sue by applebee's but, uh, whatever but but i think that it's what we've learned is that the way going forward is is actually hidden in those small little enclaves yeah. and that there's there's I don't want to call them secrets because they're not kept uh, but there's hints of the future in in these places well, mysteries being unfolded yes yeah and you can um, document it and and help like you're appreciating those things and help others mm -hmm. uh, see that and n continue it ra and celebrate what mm -hmm. is there rather I like than the just word celebrate focusing yeah. on give us something to negative. celebrate about um, about one town and, and it could be an experience with yeah. a person you meet and to mm -hmm. me that would be interesting right. you know to 
Oh, well, we met, yeah. uh, we had a great interview with the owners of a uh, shrimp shed that's outside of the levee protection system south of Golden Meadow. Yeah, mm. it's called the Seafood Shed. It's called the Seafood Shed. Mm. And uh, Very creative name. Yeah, It works. Everybody <laughs> knows the Seafood Shed. You, you ask clear, where the Seafood Shed right? is, everybody knows. Right. And uh, in the course of our talking, we managed to drink a couple bottles of wine. And yeah, this was at their kitchen table. At their kitchen table. And, uh, he was very insistent we take the wine. Yeah, I, and it doesn't take much to convince me to drink some wine. And th- he just told us about how the seafood shed came into being. And like many things in life, it was a story of happenstance and taking advantage of opportunities and then working your tail off Mm -hmm. to get it done. And I think that uh, the Terrebones Mm -hmm. really embodied Southeast Louisiana. They, They really, you know, they they do what they love. They're in the food, they're in the culture, they're in the industry, Mm. but they're not getting their paycheck from out of state. They're working for their paycheck from in state from, from they're getting their paycheck from people who buy shrimp from them and they're paying shrimpers and Mm -hmm. they're, they're right in the middle of everything. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I, I think that interview more than it, you know, uh, Mr. George was moved to tears a couple times telling us stories and we had to go off the record three or four times so he could tell more stories. <laughs> it was really an enjoyable time. And, and I, one of the things I learned from that is tell people you're writing a book because you can get all kinds of great, interesting <laughs> stuff from them. You yeah, know? Everybody loves uh, to talk. Once everybody they, once they know oh, you're yeah. listening. Yeah. People just are happy to. And I think I'm writing a book is code for I'm interested in what you have to say. Mm-hmm. Uh. So well, that sounds beautiful. Huh. Um, we've come to a point in our show where um, we ask you a question off. It's called off the menu. Nice. And um, these are questions you didn't get in your final exams in the uh, culinary school. Yeah. Excellent. So, uh, Addy, would you be willing to have horrible, nightmarish food for a year if it meant you would re- be rewarded with extraordinary wealth? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> She's being honest. If I can survive, yes. <laughs> if it doesn't kill you. How nightmarish. What would that nightmarish food look like? What's the most oh nightmarish food you can geez. think of? It Frozen entrees. Night- Frozen entrees? That's nightmarish to you? Yeah. Yeah. I don't that know. What else? I, bad home cooking? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Frozen casseroles that are old and... Yeah. All right. Yeah, basically Someone's anything in the freezer section in the in a chain, big chain grocery store to me is off limits. I don't think I've ever bought anything in the last six or eight years. Okay, yeah, I have to admit, yeah. and y'all can tell me. Oh, Margo, don't do it. No, no, no. I've never Come eaten on, we're frozen on the air. food. I never. We're being recorded. I didn't grow up eating frozen dinners or anything. Mm-hmm. I have no experience with that, but I have to admit, I have found. Oh, brother! Now that I'm a mom, there are don't some say it. frozen. I've never. Oh, it's not bad. Okay. Like Whole Foods and <laughs> Trader Joe's and places like that have some really good frozen meals. And the vegetable. Okay, y'all can tell me if you've ever heard this, but vegetables that are frozen mm-hmm. can retain their freshness more than sitting in the counter at Whole Foods for That's exactly too long. what the Jolly Green Giant or whatever it is wants no you to believe. No preservatives. No yeah. preservatives. Frozen vegetables are preservative free yeah. because Monsanto did they did they implant <laughs> that in your head? <laughs> GMO free, yeah. preservative yeah, free. Yeah, organic frozen vegetables are actually good for you cuz they usually pick frozen vegetables at the height of their um Ripeness and freshness. So frozen vegetables are not. They're definitely better than canned food. Thank you. Did you hear that? She's being polite. I'm, and I don't eat She's canned food. Polite. No, I I don't. Well, I, I don't learned all this. Food. I've been doing some volunteer work with Second Harvest, and I would do something called um, cooking matters at the store, where you take people around the grocery store and you teach them how to shop. And that's one of the things cool. we talk about: is fresh versus canned versus frozen. And you know, some people only have certain options. So talking them through 
those options and and wh- and when it makes the most sense to to buy each item. So it's now what is that through? What what program um, is that? Second Harvest, and okay. they have oh, something great. called Cooking Matters, which is a larger. That's actually that's something I'll be doing later this year. They have a six week courses where you actually teach. It, they're for you know underprivileged and underserved people. You know mostly adults. They do have some kids stuff um, to teach them how to cook and teach them around a kitchen and a grocery store. And those are like for six weeks. It's like a two or three hours a week you know on a single night and then they have a smaller program called cooking matters at the store where you actually meet them in the grocery store and you walk what you know you have a group of about eight people and you walk them through the grocery store and you just walk through the produce section the dairy the frozen the bread aisle and you know teaching like how to read labels and how to do unit pricing and you know uh, what like about the meats and which meats are healthier and so really just teaching people how to shop because you know, you just take for granted sometimes that you know how to, you way around a grocery store and how to shop and how to make good choices. And a lot of people just, you know, don't have that information. So that's been kind of fun for me to do. Excellent. Yeah. Now, I, I thought, are you doing something with uh, Grodat? Or yeah, is uh, I'm a member of their CSA. So what is that? That the, CSA? the, the um, Community Supported Agriculture is what it stands for. But so they basically actually okay so. To go back, I won a contest with Stony Field, the the yogurt people. Yeah. Um, they were giving away a five hundred dollars CSA, and this is like a blogger contest. So I was just in a competition with other bloggers, and I made an apple pie smoothie, which is actually very healthy. Um, and yeah, I, that sounds won, delicious. Yeah, that won the contest, and so I got five hundred dollars to spend on a CSA. So what? How they traditionally work is that you know you work with a farmer or a farm, or you know, so Gerdat's the it's a youth farm where you know high school age children. You know, I guess they're not children at that point, but you know, the high school age kids help with the farm and stuff like and that. And it's in City Park, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I'm actually going tour tomorrow. I'm really excited because I'm gonna oh. write something on my blog about it. But um, so you pay a fee up front, and then for a certain number of weeks, you just get a share. You buy a share, so you don't really know what you're getting, and you buy in before. I mean, they they sort of gave us a general idea of what to expect, but so you're basically paying at the beginning. And I got in thankfully with the the sponsorship level I got I got it at the highest level so not only am, are we getting our produce but we're also supporting one of the kids through you know part of the share of our payment goes to like supporting one of the kids educations which is really cool awesome so yeah yeah so in they don't really do CSAs around here but in like the Northeast I know they're really popular California mm-hmm. people just I think we more just do regular farmers market around here I don't know mm-hmm. that the CSA is really like because I had trouble finding one at first. I, mm. I happened to see it on Twitter. We've had a great experience with it so yeah. far. And, Ooh, and yeah, we uh, eat a lot of salad. We've been eating a lot of salad, a lot of vegetables. It's good, though, because... We love salad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like... Well, I, I've grown... Uh, since I've met Annie, I've grown to really love vegetables. All oh, right. I, I never hated them, but now I, I realize that my diet should be mostly vegetables. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Well, we let Jeremy off the hook. We never asked him uh, a Ooh, question. Okay. Yeah, so he we got, one. and we're running out of time quickly okay. here. Uh-oh. So we gotta. I think we gotta ask you a question. Okay. So uh, if you were uh, stuck on a desert island, or maybe I don't know, on top of a mountain peak, by your, you're trapped up in the cabin for two days okay. uh, in the snow on your honeymoon. What would what would be the one food? And you only had one food item to choose. What would that be? What would be your favorite thing to, to have with you for two days? Cheese. Cheese. Any kind of cheese. Any kind of cheese. <laughs> I actually have I actually have an embarrassing penchant for cheap cheeses. Really, <laughs> I mean I, I love expensive cheeses, but like the, but cheese whiz. No, not that cheese. <laughs> not Velveeta. Cheese food. Not cheese whiz. No, no, nothing with food after cheese. But you know, you go to the store. No, and it's no the shame two in that. Three dollar cheddar. No, that's great. The store yeah, yeah. brand pepper jack. Store is brand. Oh, that's amazing. I love that best. stuff. That's great. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I would choose. That that's an easy one. Oh, that's good. I idea. thought I was all ready for something hard. No. Uh, <laughs> Well, I think we're out of time, are we not? Yes, unfortunately. Oh, that went by so quickly. But Thank uh, you. before we go, can y'all, um, will you please tell our listeners uh, your web address? Sure, And sure. Uh, you can also add anything uh, you want to promote, and we okay. will also have on our website okay, uh, cool. information for them to access. But Absolutely. So uh, my site is cullycurious.com. That's C-U-L-I-C-U-R-I-O-U-S. Um, same handle for Twitter. My Facebook page is also the same name. 
Um, also have Pinterest, Instagram, all that in the same color curious name. Um, if you're interested in following me personally, I'm Addie K. Martin on Facebook and Twitter. Um, our book, I'm really bad and don't have any promotional material uh-huh. for it yet, but on my blog, I will eventually have a page for it. Um, I figured it wasn't smart to do pre-sales until the book was actually done. Right. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, that's pretty much where I live. Well, make sure that you send us, uh, you know, when, when the book comes out, make sure you, in a few months, make sure you send us some information. We'll, we'll post updates on our, cool. on our, uh, That'd be great. I'll send y'all a copy well. of it too. Oh, love that. Thank you so um, much, Jeremy and Addie, for coming yeah. tonight. Can we thank give you. Jeremy a plug? Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. He's got, um, he's Restless Lens on uh, Twitter. Ah. And then he has a blog called Restless Lens Without Me where you can um, keep up with all his writing. Restless linens, like lens. the lens. 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 I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Restless linens would be a totally different blog. I'm sorry. Huh. I was I'm going still blonde, stuck you're on going the honeymoon. Deaf. Yeah, right. No, for the <laughs> like <laughs> photography. Um, and we also lens. have a travel blog <laughs> called <laughs> culturecurious.net that we're slowly getting off the ground. All right. The goal is to build an empire of curious <laughs> websites. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. so. What else are you curious about? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, once again, our special guest tonight at Midnight Menu Plus One was Addie Martin, and Addie's Plus One was her husband, Jeremy Martin. You can find out more about their uh, about her blog, Cully Curious, and um, about uh, their upcoming book and all the rest by following links on our site. It's NewOrleans.com. Midnight Menu Plus One is produced by Grant Morris, and Chris Keogh is our technical director. And this fabulous audio quality that you hear is by PreSonus Audio Electronics. Makes all kinds of wonderful things. Visit PreSonus.com for more information. You can get in touch with us here at Midnight Menu Plus One by going to our website. It's NewOrleans.com. And from there, you can follow us on Twitter, find us on Facebook, sign up for our mailing list, get all kinds of swag. Uh, And while you're at It'sNewOrleans.com, you can listen to other episodes of Midnight Menu Plus One and our other shows, Happy Hour, Mindset, True to the Game, Vietnola, Out to Lunch, and others. And if you're listening to the show on iTunes, uh, please rate us and review us. It helps other people to find us. Midnight Menu Plus One is a production of INO Broadcasting for itsneworleans.com. Until we meet here again, I am Ray Kanata. And I'm Margo Moss. Thanks. Labor Day signals the unofficial end of summer, but not the end of your outdoor projects. Lowe's helps you do it right and helps you save with Labor Day deals throughout the store. Shop now and get two bags of Stay Green Potty Mix for $12. And keep your lawn looking neat and trim with a Craftsman 2-Cycle 17-inch gas string trimmer, now $20 off at just $119. Whatever's still on your to-do list this Labor Day, do it right for less. Start with Lowe's. Offers valid through 828. Soil offer excludes Alaska and Hawaii, U.S. only.